area and um, Horatio when they're having their romantic scene in the arbor. I, I saw such an echo between Lorenzo and um, Balthazar behind the curtain, and Revenge and Andre, you know, all of these spectators looking through different kind of lenses at the action centre stage. So all of those different layers I found really intriguing. I also loved um, Horatio, uh, Hieronimo rather, um, as this figure who had a kind of privileged relationship with us as spectators and the kind of warmth that she literally brought in to this staging, the different colours in terms of the lighting whenever she appeared on stage. Um, and I loved how her relationship with us kind of took over and bled through the event that Revenge was trying to orchestrate for Andrea to the extent that by the end of it, you know, she's really bleeding blood and she um, ruptures the event in some way um, and causes it to disintegrate. So that was really interesting to me. I loved all those different layers, those different circles that you found really clear metaphors um, to communicate to us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the crossover. Or to, if you want to talk a little bit about your sort of uh, area of study first, and then talk about the crossover between, say, something like this and its ori- the original practices of putting it on. My area of study is really, really cool. <laughs> But um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is contemporary practice and how there are certain symmetries between contemporary practice and early modern theatre. So it's particularly exciting to me to think about um, that collision of quite experimental approaches to making theatre today and the kind of weird formal experimentation that happens in early modern drama. Because there's a kind of, uh, it has a reputation as being something quite conventional, um, something very theatrical which um, people are used to, you know, you go and see only one drama in the theatre and there's certain things you expect to see. Um, but I think our assumptions and expectations about that form often belie its complexity and its intricacies. So that, just that thing of the different circles of reality, you know, and that lovely gesture at the beginning of having revenge reach out to somebody in the audience, immediately kind of making us question, okay, what is that supposed to happen? What, what kind of um, rules are in operation here, you know. Is that just a punter or is that somebody who is part of the theatrical event? Um, so those kind of, uh, those moments of rupture are really interesting to me and troubling our um, identification, our easy identification of, you know, classical drama as something which is quite stylized and quite um, easy to identify very quickly. So I'm interested in how you're kind of um, challenging us to think about form in new mm. ways. So that's a, a reason why I particularly liked your decision to do mm. something different with the play within the play, right? And uh, writing it as a kind of royal court pastiche of a piece <laughs> of new writing, I thought that was really intriguing because it makes us question what we see. Um, suddenly to hear language which is much more familiar to us. Yeah, and I think it's... Because it's interesting because for those of you who don't know the original play, that play within a play is... Um, it's written in a really odd style compared to the rest of the play. So the, the rhythm is all off. It's totally, um, it, it's a totally different rhythm from the black verse, iambic pentameter of the rest of the play. In the original, Thomas Kidd says, he says, Geronimo says to, goes around to all of the characters and says, um, right, so you're going to do your bit in French and you're going to do your bit in Italian. You're going to do your bit in Latin. Uh, and they all go, oh, why is this? And Geronimo goes, just, just trust me, it'll be fine. And then, and then in the play, in, in, in the play, just before it happens, um, Thomas Kidd writes, I've written this all down in English for ease. Like, if you took the moment to, to, to translate it. And so it, I think that that choice came from, like, a, an idea of going, what, you know, that, 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 what this is to us, this play within a play to us as a contemporary audience in 2016, feels as um, different as the original play within a play did, did to Thomas Kidd's audience. Right, yeah, absolutely. It's certainly something unusual. It doesn't fit into the convention of the rest of the play, right? yeah. as you're describing, it's something that feels and sounds very different. Yeah. So I love that. And also, when Elizabethans originally were watching this play in the theatre, there is this kind of frisson whenever you see that kind of violence on stage, which is play acting, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll see, but, but the play within the play troubles that notion because it's actually real violence within the logic of the play, right? People are actually killing themselves on stage. And the theatricality, the spectacle of violence is something that was kind of so prevalent in that society. So you could go and see executions, public executions, you could go and see hangings, you know. And the, the boundary between what is theatrical, what is pretense and what is reality is really, really porous 
in that society in that time. And the play is certainly investigating that and playing with that. Mm. So it's nice to um, refresh our understanding of these moments in contemporary performance, I think, rather than see it as, oh yeah, it's just a standard play within the play, which is really yeah. familiar. And, and is that... I mean, I don't feel like I know the history of plays within plays, um, but it feels to me like that's quite an early attempt at doing that sort of thing. It's one of the first, right. yeah, absolutely. Very first times. And it's also one of the first revenge tragedies as well. As well. Yeah, it's picking up on a revenge tradition which was very popular in Roman theatre. Okay. Seneca, for instance, yeah. is often a big kind of name that flashes up. People Seneca, who revenge. was friends with Nero, or New Nero, right? New Nero. And Nero, Nero, that line in the play where Nero is talking, uh, where Hieronimo talks mm. about Nero playing in tragedies, right? Nero would orchestrate theatrical events where um, aristocrats would um, play characters who actually murdered people on stage in these theatrical events, but the people that they murdered were slaves and they would really kill them. So it was a kind of theatricalized version of public execution. Sort of like, so like the gladiator thing, but they. Yeah. It's advertised as a kind of dramatic reality, right? But they're, they're actually killing slaves and um, criminals on stage. So, you know, Hieronimo citing that is really plugging into that idea yeah. of the boundary between what's real and what's uh, theatrical. Because she ends up killing them. Exactly, because she does it for real. Wow. In her play within the play. <laughs> yeah. And when, and when did that stop? <laughs> <laughs> why, why are we still doing that today? I was just thinking that, you know, the Channel 4 series, Jump, Celebrities, <laughs> 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 they're very similar, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they just they do this scheme thing and then they injure themselves. <laughs> and I decide to buy them as a Satan. It still happens to this day. Um, uh, and I just wanted to ask you as well, like, what? Uh, so, where where you think that like the, the structures of making plays? And where uh, it, it, in Thomas Kidd's sort of time, mm-hmm. and how that plugs into today, the structure of making plays. So, so the the um, the way in which plays are made, and the and productions are made, and whether or not there's a crossover. Is it today? today? Yeah. So, say, say the way that that can, so that people who you're interested in, how they might make. Um, well, one of the things which um, characterised practice back then was there was a kind of uncertainty in terms of the theatrical event, which um, for anyone who's seen companies like Fourth Entertainment today, for instance, they really play on this notion that people don't quite know what they're doing when they're on stage, and therefore kind of reality bleeds through, you can't help it, because you, you're not quite certain what's going to happen next. And because of the way that they rehearsed then, I mean, in, in the Elizabethan era, um, you had 2,000 people in a theatre, so in terms of the population of London, that's quite a lot of people. So you can't rely on pe- on having um, a huge audience to satisfy, right? So if you've got 2,000 people coming in to see a play, mm-hmm. you're going to need to put on a new play the next day because you're going to have a lot of the same people coming back, right? So you don't have long-running events. You literally have a couple of days to rehearse something, put it up on its feet. If people don't like it, you pull it immediately and something else comes up. So the repertoire is changing constantly. Um, rehearsal, as we understand it, didn't really exist. People just had their cue scripts, or the actors had their cue scripts. And, and then it got rewritten and re-performed, didn't it? Yeah, so all of the additions to the play happened um, some decades after it premiered. So it premiered in the 1580s. And then a lot of people think that Shakespeare wrote some of the additional scenes. Mm. And the additional scenes were created because Hieronimo was such a popular character. So you really notice in this production that Hieronimo doesn't really feature until about halfway through so you've you've inserted a speech near the beginning and you've given it to Hieronimo, you haven't inserted the speech the speech exists but I think it's spoken by a general or something and then Hieronimo speaks it very early on which establishes a relationship between her and us but in the play it it takes a long time for Hieronimo's experience to become the centre of gravity of the event Mm. Um, and that just got larger and larger and larger because audiences were so interested in Hieronimo's grief, in Hieronimo's emotions. So all of those massive monologues of Hieronimo just speaking directly to the audience, they were inserted much later. And they just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until the play became known as Hieronimo. 
Go to his mouth again. You want to his mouth again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like she, like she, like sorry, like he, in the original, yeah. like he'd been mad the first time. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. One of those mad again. So you get quite a lot of repetitive monologues. Of <laughs> Hieronimo coming on again and telling us how sad he is and <laughs> how awful it is um, and how he needs to instigate revenge in some form. So, but those additions, you know, the the appetite for this character. And how this character takes over the play, I think, is mirrored in a really interesting way in this production. So, mm. so you've got Revenge trying to set everything up. Revenge orchestrating this kind of revenge play. It literally all the props, you know, belong to Revenge. Um, but then Hieronimo um, takes over, grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And I loved how kind of the, the warm light um, overrode the kind of very clean and stark, kind of natural, not natural, what's the word, um, like white light mm. of Revenge's event. Yeah, and I loved how she had a kind of privileged contact with us. So one of the best moments for me is where she came up the steps and um, there's a kind of hyper-realism to her disclosure of her experience and her relationship with us. It felt totally different. The rest of it felt more stylized to me mm. than this kind of really beautiful, privileged mode of communication we had with Hieronimo. And that became really engaging. And that speech is extraordinary as well, and it's... Um... At least I think it's amazing in its um, simplicity and mm. its uh, total clarity of thought, yeah. which feels to me so rare in this era of play. Of, of, like, there's no metaphor there. She's literally just talking about what it's like for a parent to love their son. Yeah. Kid's quite good at that. He doesn't overdo it. Yeah, not at all. Yeah, yeah which is amazing. Like, kid, yeah, Kid just is sort of really, um, feels really contemporary in that regard. Doesn't, there's no poem, there's not much poetry. It's yeah. quite simple. I thought what was quite interesting about that was that you know you're saying now that Hiranuma is actually a man yeah. in the original. Yeah. I thought that was a really good turn of speech. Yeah. It felt like it should have come from a mother. It yeah. didn't feel like it should have been from a father in in, in some ways. So it's I didn't I knew because we <laughs> that you changed some of the gender of the mm. characters. Um. I wasn't sure throughout whether I was like, oh, Hieronimo must be uh-huh. a man. But then after that speech, I was like, oh, maybe not. Maybe right. that wasn't a change. Like, he is meant to be a man. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. My mum said exactly the same thing when she came to see it. Um, she thought that that speech just feels like it's about a mother to her son. Yeah. Which is so odd to think that it was, it's, I mean, it is originally, it's like, <laughs> does not a father love a frisking kid as much as a son? Um, and there are bits of like, is it so in the original play, Hieronimo has a has a wife called Isabella, and uh, and so we've sort of there are bits of Isabella's speech in this um, in this version, but mostly Isabella is, is sort of unpresent in our version. But that none of that is, is Isabella. That's all Hieronimo. Is. So it's like little bits here and there. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting insight, and maybe that's why it was so compelling and unusual to uh-huh. the audience. You know, to see this. Emotion in this character, you know, Hieronimo's grief mm. becomes this extraordinary thing that just grows and grows and grows. Mm. Cool. Um, okay, well, we might just open up for any questions or thoughts or chats if there are any. Uh, don't worry if not. Yeah, why did you use two different colours of blood? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a thing that's yeah. come up a few times. <laughs> um, so the blue blood was originally a, a thought that I had way back when um, looking into doing the play. And it just, because the original impulse was about trying to react against a frustration that I had with um, plays using red blood, when everything else on stage was clearly false. It felt odd to me that, that the thing that was perhaps the most real was, uh, was, uh, was sorry, the thing that was perhaps the... Um, uh, the thing which we all know is like not real. We know that's not real blood. If you're, if, if an actor stabs himself on stage, we know it's not real blood that they're bleeding. Um, and that felt really weird to me that in, in even the most abstract production, they always use red blood. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we try and extrapolate that a little bit and see what happens if we use blue blood? And then the more I interrogated the script, the more I realised it's also about class and about aristocracy and the way in which there are different sorts of um, actions and internal. Uh, goings on for the aristocracy and for lower classes. So that was that choice, and that then felt to the right in the setup we were going for. 
But then the idea was that, that Hieronimo, in the same way she breaks the lighting scheme, she breaks this rule as well. And in, in, by killing herself and by, by, by reacting against what Revenge and Andrea are doing, she finds a new truth in her expulsion of blood. And that's real. I think the idea was that that was sort of the reality, and this is all sort of fake. It doesn't exist. This is unreal. It's so ridiculous that it doesn't really make sense. Whereas the red blood um, is is something that feels more truthful. Um, but I'm not sure that reads. <laughs> it does actually. It does. Because, okay. Yeah, it does because I mean, all well, this was sort of staged mm-hmm. death, basically. Yeah. Her own her killing herself basically came from her own heart. Yeah. You know, it was her own emotion because her her son was dead and her life was shattered and she had nothing to live for. Yeah. You know, and that's that's yeah. how I saw it. That's oh, where all the red blood, you know, it was sort of truthful death basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because this was all staged. Yeah, and, and all of these happen within the context of something else yes, as well, whereas yes. Hieronimo just decides she just can't live anymore. Yeah. The same, it was almost as if all of the other characters there was something quite two dimensional about their motives and their stories and their experiences. Whereas Hieronimo, because of that kind of privileged relationship that we have with her, mm-hmm. she goes on such a much larger mm-hmm. journey. And we really are taken into that process of grief and how that transforms into this impulse for revenge. But that felt kind of real in a totally different register, in a totally different way to the other characters and their more dubious. Yeah. It's true, because I think she's the only one who actually makes an emotional connection to the audience. Uh-huh. You know, because she's a mother. I mean, good, she you change the gender, but you can still see it as a parent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can sort of feel, especially if you're a parent yourself, you can sort of feel the grief. You know, it's your only son. You know, the, the son carries the name. And, you know, the implications of losing the only son, which is basically the end of your line. Mm-hmm. That's it. And he is gone, and she has nothing to live for, and he's also the insurance to her old age. You know, it all comes together. Yeah, she, she loses everything. She has nothing to live for anymore. That's it. And that's the end. And now she's killed everyone yeah. as well. She can yeah. now. Now Balthazar and Lorenzo yeah. is gone. She can sort of happily kill herself yeah. in, in peace. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that. Yeah, that was really... her warm heart's blood, basically. That's how mm. I saw it. That's great. Right. <laughs> Why did you choose to do the Spanish tragedy? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> <laughs> this is a genuine story. So there was a um, uh, I I studied with Ben at uni, and um, we uh, we studied the Spanish tragedy as part of a module called European Theatre, and there was. Uh, a boy, in, we had a seminar, and there was a boy in it who I uh, uh, I remember really vividly. Like, I don't remember you know these details normally. I'm really, really bad at these details. But basically, we were chatting about the Spanish tragedy for about an hour and a half. And towards the end of the, the, the seminar, he just sort of leaned forward and he went, I just, I just didn't believe that Hieronimo would bite out his tongue. And I remember getting really angry <laughs> that something in a play which is obviously fake and ridiculous and extreme that, that everything else up until that moment he believed <laughs> like <laughs> he believed that um, that first of all Spain and Portugal have to be crossed by the sea he believed that um, uh, he believed that, that a woman would go that, a mad, that this person would go on a massive rampage of death and slaughter in order to get revenge on their son he believed that um, uh, uh, that there was this ridiculous play within a play where everyone actually dies but he didn't believe that this man, taken to the most extreme depth of grief that you could ever go, would bite out their tongue. And everything else was fine, but it was that, but that was the thing that was wrong. So then I sort of had this really um, uh, circular thing of going, this is, there's something amazing about this play, that the that, that kid is absolutely and clearly interrogating about theatre and about reality, and the way we interact with those things as audiences. And then it just sort of spun around in my mind for years, and before we got to this. That's the reason. It started genuinely there going, there's something interesting about this. And I've got to work it out why that thought process happened. Puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then with barrel organ, you thought a lot about violence, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does, does that kind of make you interested in this play? Yeah, I realised that as well in the last year, that definitely there's something about, there's something really interesting about putting violence on stage, and what that means for violence on stage, or in art in general, and especially now, but it's actually especially any time in the last hundred years, when violence has been so present in the news and in our daily lives, and what does it mean to watch violence as entertainment and to go to the theatre to pay money or to go to the cinema to pay money whilst eating your popcorn and to watch people die? And what, does, what does that mean? Um, uh, or, vice, or, 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 you know, similarly, if, to watch um, other sorts of violence, whether that's structural or economic or um, social violence, you know, why are we, what, why are we, why do we put ourselves through these things when? You turn on the news and it's there. Um, this might be a good um, <clears throat> follow-on question. What uh, drew you towards sticking this play inside an abattoir? <laughs> Lizzie? Well, Lizzie's our set design. Um, so I suppose our first thought was we wanted this to be Revenge's theatrical space. And so I guess what drew us to the that we were interrogating if Revenge had a theatrical space, what would it look like? And so what would like a theatre of the underworld look like? And yeah, and also what's a space that allows for the kind of anticipation of violence mm. or allows to imagine what could go on and facilitates that and everything is very sort of focused on abuse. We had a cellar one point. Yeah, and we were looking at maybe tiling the whole space. We were also interested in how we used the space and how the audience felt um, they reacted with it. Um, I think the idea of putting it in a curve, we wanted to mm. kind of break up the space as we went out and have people see it. So, yeah, this was all kind of. This seating arrangement, you know, we're like on the half of the stage, you know, kind of watching each other. Yeah. Well, that curtain is great because it conjures an abattoir, but it also gives you theatricality. Mm. It's such a potent still metaphor. But all of the kind of looking through the curtain back and forth is really invective. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> if she dead, she looked dead. 
Did you ever feel any of that real stuff at all with that final death or not? Yes, the final death, but the one and mm-hmm. That was the only time where it actually sort of connected. It looked more real to mm-hmm. me. Whereas the other one was very staged. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just more symbolic. Mm-hmm. It was not a real death on stage. It was sort of something that comes out of the So it was just in her death. It was, again, that sort of more human mm-hmm. connection. Falls through the curtain, which cuts the other ones off, mm. and then she comes back into our space here, yeah, into the space of the audience, and connects. Uh, Say so she had the only human bond you know, of all the actors with the audience, and you know, this step was quite well done. So, yeah. um, we should probably stop there on death and rule breaking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but thank you for sticking around and thanks for coming to see the show. And uh, I'll see you all soon. <laughs> <laughs>